Hello, welcome back to topic 8, part 4, climate. The aim for today is to describe the factors that affect the climate of a region. So what is climate? Different from weather, climate is the average weather conditions of a region over many years. So we compare long-term weather patterns to come up with this general climate for an area. So two variables that we need um, to describe climate are temperature and moisture. So we talk about whether the area is warm or cool, and we talk about whether the area is dry or wet. And in order to classify regions um, based on moisture, we would say that the area was either arid, which means dry, or humid, which of course means wet. And you can see with different landscapes um, in these pictures that develop based on the type of moisture in an area. So to describe moisture level of an area, we compare the precipitation level to the evapotranspiration level. So precipitation, of course, is anything that comes down moisture from a cloud that um, uh, from a cloud and lands on Earth's surface. And evapotranspiration is when moisture is put back into the atmosphere, uh, whether by evaporation or by transpiration, which of course we all recall comes from trees or plants. So if you have more precipitation, so if precipitation is greater than evapotranspiration, you have more coming down from the clouds than you have evaporating into the air, you would have a humid climate. If you have less precipitation than evapotranspiration, you have more moisture being put into the atmosphere than coming down out of the atmosphere, this would be an arid climate. So we can compare these two factors in order to, uh, to figure out what type of um, climate an area has. So this is called your climate ratio, which is P over EP, where P stands for the amount of precipitation and EP is the amount of evapotranspiration. There are eight factors we're going to discuss. We've talked about some of them before, but we'll refresh our memories. Um, eight factors that affect climate, and we're going to describe what those effects are. And those are latitude, altitude or elevation, mountain ranges, closeness to large bodies of water, ocean currents, planetary wind belts or prevailing winds, the amount of vegetation, the amount of cloud cover, and the first factor we'll discuss is latitude. So if you look at this thermal imaging of Earth's surface, you can see the coloring. They've done isotherms to show different temperatures on Earth. I'm sure you've seen weather maps where the similar um, effect has been used. And you can see the temperatures change where it's generally warmer near the equator and cooler as you go towards the poles. So if you talk about how latitude affects temperature in general, as latitude increases, we're going from a lower latitude near the equator towards a higher latitude, which would be towards the poles. So if it's increasing, what happens to temperature? So as you move from the equator towards the poles, what happens to our temperature? Of course, it decreases. So if we want to graph that relationship, we would show that as an indirect relationship. As latitude increases, temperature decreases. Next factor we'll talk about is elevation or altitude. So if you think about elevation as moving upwards in the atmosphere from Earth's surface, let's think about it in terms of climbing a mountain. As you climb towards the top of a very high mountain, what do you typically find at the tops of a mountain? Okay, we typically find snow at the top of the mountain. If we look on page 14 on our reference table, it also shows this on um, the uh, here in the troposphere, how if you start at the surface at sea level, it's about 15 degrees average. And if you go up towards uh, the top of the troposphere, so you're increasing in altitude, the temperature goes down to negative 55. So we live in the troposphere, and temperature, of course, decreases with elevation. As elevation increases, the average annual temperature decreases. So again, our elevation is increasing, temperature is decreasing. This gives us an indirect relationship. Mountains. So how do mountains affect the climate? This is referred to as the orographic effect. All right? And this describes what happens as um, air and moisture approaches a mountain. 
So orographic effect is caused when you have rising air on the windward side of the mountain. So as the windward or the wind is approaching the mountain, it has nowhere to go but up. So it's forced up the mountain side. As the air is forced upward, the air expands and cools, right? Because it gets cooler as that air goes up the mountain. Once it cools to the dew point temperature, you end up forming clouds by condensation. And this then does lead to an increase in the likelihood of precipitation. So you end up with this rising, cooling air precipitating on one side of the mountain, and then it loses all of its moisture, comes over to the other side of the mountain, and is, sinks downward back towards the surface. And now you have this dry air that, as it goes back down towards Earth's surface, is going to get warmer since the temperature increases from up in the atmosphere down towards the surface. And this is called the leeward side of the mountain, the side that's not on the windward side. The sinking air compresses and gets warmer, and you end up with very little rain occurring on that side of the mountain. So the rain shadow effect, many deserts are located on the leeward side of the mountain, and this is considered the rain shadow, meaning they're opposite the side where the rain is occurring. So again, some examples of the orographic effect. Here's New York State, and up here we have the, um, if you recall from our landscapes, we've got the Adirondack Mountains over here, and we've got the Catskills over here, and you can see there's different, uh, there's varying amounts of precipitation. Um, based on where the wind is coming from and going towards um, based on these mountain ranges. The leeward sides of Adirondacks and Catskills receive much less precipitation. So how does the orographic effect affect climate? The windward side is going to be cooler and moister. Okay? That's where your precipitation occurs. And your leeward side is going to be warmer and drier. And this is your desert side of your mountain range. So this is, again, depicting California on the west coast. And we're now looking at how closeness to large bodies of water. So how is an area affected by being near to a large body of water, which actually also applies to us on Long Island? We live close to the Atlantic Ocean and the Great South Bay, and that affects our temperatures and climate here on Long Island. So if you look at the um, west coast right on the coastline and the temperatures here, you can see them, they're showing average temperatures in the low to mid-60s, where if you just move a little bit inland here, they're in the upper 80s and 90s. So why would being closer to the water change your temperature range when you're at the same latitude and same um, elevation? When you are close to a body of water, it actually moderates your temperatures. So there's a special property of water we talked about before called specific heat. Specific heat, we know with water, um, it shows the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of a substance by one degree. So if we take water and compare it to land, remember water takes a lot more energy to heat up and takes a lot more time to cool back down, to lose that energy. So if we um, are located near a body of water, during the winter months, that water is holding on to the heat and still releasing it into the atmosphere and keeping it warmer a little longer. And during the summer, the water is cooler and is released and is um, keeping the area actually cooler than it would otherwise be if you were not near the body of water. You can think about this also this way. If you go to the beach um, in the beginning of the summer, let's say the end of June and beginning of July, the ocean tends to be really cold. But if you wait and go back to the beach in August, September, or even the beginning of October, the ocean is much warmer. Since the ocean takes time, the water takes a lot of time due to its high specific heat, to heat up, it then is going to keep that area warmer longer by by releasing that heat into the atmosphere even as you go into the fall and the beginning of the winter months. Now on the flip side of that, it, it also um, will take time to cool back down. So, um, and, and then again, heat back up. So when you get into um, to when it would actually be the coldest, it's not coldest right in December. It's probably hitting its coldest temperatures in January or February due to that lag in time for it to cool down or heat up. So it's going to keep the area in the winter a little bit warmer because it's still holding on to some of that heat. So what, living near the coast actually um, is, gives a moderating effect, which means it keeps the temperatures a little more average. So looking at this picture here, we're looking at two different areas that are um, up near the North Pole. Um, one of them is in Iceland, okay, and one of them is in Russia. And you can see we're looking at this climograph that's showing the average temperatures um, for Iceland 
and the average temperatures over the course of the year for Russia. And you can also, you'll notice there's a big difference between these two graphs. You can see that this here in Iceland is a much flatter range of temperatures, where here in Russia it's a much larger range of temperatures. Okay, this climate graph shows a much bigger change. Um, if you take a look at where they're located on Earth, they're both located near the Arctic Circle. Okay, so they're at a very similar latitude. So it's not latitude that's affecting this huge temperature change um, between the two areas. What's affecting it is that um, Iceland, this uh, Reykjavik, Iceland, is much closer to water, where Yakutsk, Russia, is in the middle of the land. So the water near Iceland is keeping the temperatures here much more average. Okay, so it's not allowing there to be a huge extreme of warms and colds um, over the course of the year. And if you look here at Russia, it's inland, and you end up with a much wider change um, and much more extreme warms and extreme colds uh, than you do if you're close to the water. Again, just like on Long Island, we have a similar effect where we don't get nearly as hot as more inland might get, and where we also don't get nearly as cold as more inland would get. All right, so how does closeness to a large body of water affect climate? If you live near the coast, you're considered to be in a marine climate. Water moderates the temperature. That means it keeps it medium, okay? It keeps it in moderation, which is very average. This leads to us having cooler summers and warmer winters than we would be if we were more inland and not in a coastal climate. So looking at these two cities, city A and city B, we can tell which one of these is most likely near a body of water. Okay, so remember, the, the, the more average your temperature is, the flatter this curve is, that is most likely being moderated by a body of water. So city B in this example is near a body of water, and city A is more inland. So if you have a continental climate, meaning you're more inland, you end up with warmer summers and cooler winters. So you get more extremes for your climate than you do if you're near the coast. Ocean currents. Remember, we have cool and warm currents. We're looking here at the Gulf Stream, which is bringing warm water up the coast, um, the east coast of North America. So if you live near a warm current, this is going to generally warm up the climate. And if you live near a cool current, it's going to generally cool down the climate. Wind belts. Okay, depending on the, um, where your wind or your air is coming from as it moves air masses along. Your wind is going to move different air masses across to, um, your country. And if the prevailing winds will blow air in generally the same direction over the course of the year. So this determines whether you are generally getting colder air, warmer air, drier air, or wetter air. So that will be a big determination in what kind of climate region you live in. The amount of vegetation that an area has. The more vegetation, the cooler and wetter the environment. So most vegetation does not like to live in extremely hot environments, and it also doesn't like extremely dry environments. So if there's more vegetation, it tends to be a cooler and wetter area. Cloud cover. Certain areas of the country, like Seattle, or certain countries like England, are known for having a lot of cloud cover. If there's a lot of cloud cover, less insulation is able to come through that cloud cover, which is going to cause the average temperatures to decrease. Okay, we have two uh, weather events we'll also discuss now. The first one's called a monsoon. This is um, something that occurs um, near Arizona, and it's also a condition that occurs in the Middle East, near Southern Asia and East Africa. This is basically like a large-scale land sea breeze condition, if you recall when we talked about land and sea breezes, where you end up with um, a part of the year being colder and drier and part of the year being uh, wetter, based on where the, what the wind is blowing from. So in the winter, you end up with a land breeze where cold, dry air is causing high pressure over the land, so the wind comes off the land and out to sea. And during the summer, you end up with a sea breeze condition where you have low pressure over the land and high pressure over the water, which brings the air breeze off of the water, causing it to be much rainier since it's carrying all that moisture with it. So this is a diagram showing um, summer monsoon winds over um, near the Middle East, where you have the summer acts as a sea breeze with the air, um, air coming off the water towards the land and in the winter it acts as a land breeze, a large scale over a, long, a wide area where the wind is coming off of the land. So you end up with dry winters and rainy summers. 
El Nino also has been in the news on and off in the last 10 to 15 years. This is another condition that's caused when the Pacific Ocean gets warmer than normal. When the Pacific Ocean gets warmer, it changes the weather patterns in that area. If you have warmer air rising instead of sinking, that what might normally happen, it's going to change what weather pattern is going on in that area. It'll change whether you have winds coming off the land, towards the sea, and it'll actually ends up causing a widespread global change in our weather patterns. This happens, it tends to happen every few years. There's some discrepancy on, and to exactly when it is occurring or not occurring. Um, but when it happens and they, they find patterns to the warming of the Pacific Ocean and how it affects climate globally, um, it tends to bring bad weather by us. Um, but the winters during an El Nino uh, in the west tend to be stormy. In the south, tend to be cold and wet. In the northeast, it's warmer. And this is another diagram showing um, how you end up with a complete change um, in the direction of your currents, your weather, your wind system. So normal conditions, it's showing here um, where your upwelling of the ocean is occurring and the circulation patterns and how this changes um, during a El Nino condition. Okay, so that is the end of our climate section, um, and I'll see you next time.